Welcome to Getting High on Arizona, the show that turns low points into highlights and focuses on Arizona on all elevations. Today, Vera takes us to one of the deepest meteor craters in the world. Peter shows us the beauty of Oak Creek Canyon, also known as the smaller cousin of the Grand Canyon. To take us even higher, Pim looks at the San Francisco peaks and its beautiful scenery. And Tessa takes us to the stars by showing us around Lowell Observatory. Welcome to Getting High on Arizona. In this show, we'll take a look at the beauty of Arizona by visiting the lowest up to the highest points in the state. I'm Vera Limburg. And I'm Victor Norbert. The goal of our show is to ensure that no area worth seeing is ignored. Therefore, we have selected the very ultimate locations of northern Arizona nature to share with you. We'll do this by taking new steps upward as far as we can go. So let's start at the lowest point of Arizona. What is the lowest point of Arizona? Well, this week I went to see the Barringer Crater. This enormous hole was created by a meteor, which scientists guess weighs over 300,000 tons and was about 50 meters in diameter. So, let's take a look at one of the youngest but largest meteor craters in the world. Hello, it's me. I'm standing next to the Meteor Crater Center, where they have one of the biggest and most famous craters in the whole entire world. This is the Barringer Crater, located 35 miles east of Flagstaff. The crater is 50,000 years old, and the meteorite hit with a power of 20 million tons of TNT, leaving behind a hole so big, 20 football fields and 2 million spectators fit in it. We spoke with Eduardo Rubio, a tour guide at the Meteor Center with a passion for outer space. The crater takes us back 50,000 years. That's the current theory. It has a meteorite coming in from the east at 26,000 miles an hour and leaving a crater, this, we're on the crater floor, 700 feet deep. Besides looking at the crater, there are plenty of other things to indulge in. Eduardo tells us his favorite spots. We have a movie theater, a 10 minute movie that runs every half hour in the, in the theater. We have uh, what we call the Discovery Center, uh, the muse which is the museum. The Discovery Center offers a lot of interactive displays about the crater. And then we have a gift shop, a rock shop. We have the Astronaut Wall of Fame. And we even have a Subway restaurant. Every year, over 300,000 tourists come and take a look at the crater. We ask one of them, Fred Lewis, his opinion. A lot of awe, because you got to remember, to make that big of a hole, all that dirt and stuff had to come out. And the man said that uh, right now it's, it's 500 feet deep. And originally it was 700, so that's a lot of debris up in the air. The most interesting piece in the Meteor Center has to be the Holsinger meteorite. This is the biggest and heaviest piece from the one that made the crater. It weighs 1,406 pounds. Recently, another meteorite was spotted in Arizona. However, it was way smaller than the Barringer one. We spoke with Josh Bengal. So what we saw over southern Arizona, south central Arizona, was what everyone's calling the Arizona fireball or a meteor that came through the night sky or early morning sky and created a little bit of a boom but a really great glow in the night sky and from what we know about it it's they guess it's about three meters in size so it's it's fairly large and it uh, it would have entered our atmosphere and begun to burn up. Um, those atoms around it would have started to ionize, and that's the color that we see starting to come off of it. It's moving at about 60 to 70 miles per second, so extremely, extremely fast. Can you imagine how big the impact must have been 50,000 years ago? Reaching new heights, this is Vera from NHTV, getting high on Arizona. Back to the studio. If you would ever like to visit the crater, it is located off of I-40 on Meteor Crater Road, Flagstaff, Arizona. We have started at the lowest point. Now it's time to climb the next step on the ladder. Our reporter Peter van Os visited Oak Creek Canyon, which is the entrance at Sedona as seen from Flagstaff. It is a beautiful preserved nature park open to the public. 
The beautiful red rock formations have been part of Arizona's history ever since they were discovered. Peter tells us more about the geological layers and formations of the canyon and the red rock surrounding the area. Oak Creek Canyon is a place you definitely have to visit once in a lifetime. And luckily for you, you can experience the beauty of Oak Creek Canyon from your own living room. So, without further ado, let's reach even higher. Peter? Thank you, Victor and Vera. I'm standing in what might be one of the most beautiful places Northern Arizona has to offer, Oak Creek Canyon. Rarely does a place offer such diversity and serenity. Take a look as we dive into its deep natural history. Geological evidence suggests that the formation of Oak Creek Canyon began 8 to 10 million years ago, while the surrounding red rocks contain layers of more than 300 million years old. Doctor of Earth Sciences Nick McKay has a lot of information about the sediments. Uh, the area was formed by the, uh, all the remarkable white and red and tannish rocks in the area are all sedimentary rocks, so these are rocks that were formed either by um, sand dunes that were blowing across the area and then eventually lithified into rocks or by river deposits and then uh, those, those built up over millions and millions of years and then much more recently um, a canyon has cut down in, into those rocks exposing the, all those strata. The striking color that gives Sedona its special character is coming from iron in the rocks which oxidizes and gives it a red hue much like rust does. One thing that makes Oak Creek Canyon so special is that you have all this amazing rock that is sort of set there and, and, um, and then we have this great canyon that exposes it all and because we're in a, a pretty dry climate, all of that, all those rock exposures remain uh, visible. You can see them all, they're not um, hidden by, uh, by lots of vegetation that would be there if we were in a wetter part of the world. It is time to travel into the heart of Oak Creek Canyon where we are able to speak to Ranger Mark Goshorn about the many experiences the area can provide. Oak Creek Canyon is about 12 miles long, anywhere from 0.8 to 2.5 miles wide. It's about 30 to 31 square kilometers. Sedona is a small town, but it is also a large tourist attraction. Uh, it's the second most visited area in Arizona outside of the Grand Canyon. So we are a tourism-based population. Even though the area is a hotspot for tourists, there are countless opportunities to find a peaceful spot to embrace nature. This is a really good spot to come and get away from the normal busy and populated campgrounds. I like it because it's very remote and you're close to the creek. Some of the things that people can experience in Oak Creek Canyon is we do have the creek itself, so there are numerous swimming holes throughout. There's plenty of fishing that a lot of people like to do. Oak Creek Canyon is special as far as it's a riparian area in the northern part of the Sonoran Desert. And it's just the topography, the trails that we have here, the fact that we have Oak Creek here. There's a variety of plant life and wildlife throughout, so it's just a good scenic, easily accessible area. Whether you are here to hike, to camp, or to see the sights, Sedona and the Oak Creek Canyon will leave a lasting impression on you. Witness it, and you won't soon forget it. For NHTV, my name is Peter, getting high in Arizona. And remember, if you want to visit any location mentioned in the show, you can always visit our Facebook page, at High on Arizona. We're already halfway on our trip to the maximum elevation of Arizona. As we ascend higher towards our final destination, there is still one more beautiful location to visit. Our reporter Pim Plum dares to face a breathtaking journey towards the summit of the San Francisco peaks. But these aren't just ordinary mountains. They are considered sacred to the Native Americans in this area. Also, he visits Buffalo Park and Snowball. And he will tell us more about the impact on the preserved nature of the San Francisco peaks. So continuing our rise to ultimate altitudes, it's time to ascend above the rooftops of Northern Arizona to the San Francisco peaks. Pim Plum has the story. Hi, my name is Pim, and today we're going to visit one of the most beautiful places here in Arizona, namely the San Francisco Peaks. There are six peaks in total. 
The highest peak is the Humphreys Peak. It's over 3,800 meters high. One great way to visit the mountains is with the Arizona Snowball Ski Lift. In the winter, they use parts of the mountain as skiing and recreation area. During the summer, the lift is used to go up the mountain. At the top of the ski lift, there is a little house in which you can find a ranger whom you can ask any question you might have. One of these rangers is Ranger John. I mostly try to stay out of people's way so that they can enjoy the view and the mountain. There's over 600 volcanic sites. Anything that's above the plateau, that's, I mean, the classic pointy tops are volcanic, but a lot of these other things down in the valley that are above that flat Colorado plateau are volcanic also. Well, a couple of things that are unique to this spot, if we, if we look to the north on a really clear day, you can see the Grand Canyon from here. Grand Canyon is about 75 miles away, yeah, but you can tell what you're looking at on a crisp day. And there's a spot over there where you can look to the south and see the Red Rock in Sedona. And on a, again, on a crisp day, you can, you can see that it's red. So at some point you can look south and see Sedona, turn around and see the Grand Canyon. Where else can you do that? Nowhere. So as we have already seen, the San Francisco peaks are one of the most beautiful places in the US. But aside from the beautiful nature, the San Francisco peaks also have a spiritual meaning to some Native American people. We met with one of these Native Americans, Klee, at the base of the mountains in Buffalo Park. Klee is of the Navajo or Diné people. The San Francisco peaks are very special to him. The San Francisco peaks are an integral part of the identity for Diné people. And they are holy to more than 13 indigenous nations, culturally significant to all 22 indigenous nations throughout the uh, area known as Arizona. But for us as Diné people, it's part of the foundation of our identity. We have tithlej, which are called mountain soil bundles. And in the ceremonies that we perform to restore balance and harmony within our lives and our communities, every single ceremony it, it is connected to this mountain and to the other holy mountains that we have. And so for Diné people, we um, can't go on this mountain unless we have a special prayer or some sp specific purpose. Uh, to be able to, to, to approach this mountain. There are offerings, there are herbs that we gather on this mountain that can't be gathered anywhere else. Recently, Snowball has started using reclaimed water to create more snow to expand their skiing area and season. They have approval from the city of Flagstaff, but the Navajo people aren't as happy about it. It's the year 2016 and as indigenous people, the first people of these lands, we don't have protection for our religious freedom when it comes down to public land uh, use and management in sacred places. Money and recreation, uh, and this is short-term economic gain, it's only seasonal, matter more than native cultures, matter more than native lives, and more than our environment and ecosystem. Even though the peaks have become a topic of great controversy, there is still definitely a site worth visiting should you ever find yourself in Arizona. Today, we give you guys a little insight on the historical background, stuff to see and stuff to do here in the San Francisco Peaks. We hope you enjoyed watching. Reaching new heights, I'm Pim for NHV, getting high on Arizona. On our journey so far, we've reached many elevations, from a huge hole of hundreds of meters deep to actual mountains. You might think that the highest mountain in Arizona is as high as we can get. But here at Getting High on Arizona, there are no limits. Our reporter Tessa Smith has reached the stars by visiting the highest place possible the universe. We have showed you different nat natural phenomena. We started at the bottom, the meteor crater, and we took one step at a time to reach our final destination. And now we're here, Lowell Observatory. So far we've visited great heights. You might assume that we can go higher than the San Francisco peaks, but we still have one more place to go. We can't really visit it, but we can observe it through the telescopes at Lowell Observatory. I'm going to the universe. I'm Tessa and let's go reach the stars. Lowell spokesperson Josh Bangle says there is an extraordinary history here at the observatory.
Well, Lowell was founded in 1894 by a gentleman named Percival Lowell, who moved here from the East Coast. Um, he sent his assistant out to find dark sky locations, and this is what he found. Besides telescopes, Lowell also has exhibitions. Here, guests can learn all about astronomy in a playful and educational way. The current exhibition is all about meteors. Intern Molly Baker was very eager to tell us all about it. Space Guard Academy is all about asteroids and really interesting for all ages. Um, there's lots of videos to watch that will tell you about the science behind asteroids. It tells you about the impacts and a lot of the history behind what scientists and astronomers have learned about them. So the last exhibit was called Pluto at 85 and it was based on uh, New Horizons and that research. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen next with the exhibit. We're going to start brainstorming, but Space Guard will at least be here for a year. Um, and then after that it might travel around. Lowell is fit for all ages. Ten-year-old Lydia experienced a day to never forget. Uh, so I first saw the uh, experiments and demonstrations in the visitor center, and then I went out to the Pluto walk and saw the Pluto telescope and the Clark telescope. I am incredibly interested in the universe and how it works and if it will keep expanding or if it will stop or what will happen to the universe. Lowell Observatory is primarily famous for the discovery of planet or for some considered dwarf planet Pluto. Pluto was first theorized by Percival Lowell who called it a trans-Neptunian planet. So we searched for Pluto in the early 1900s. He never found it. His death came a little bit earlier than everyone expected and the search for Planet X at Lowell Observatory started to slow down. Clyde Thomba, at 23 years old, was using the Pluto Discovery Telescope and discovered Pluto in one very cold and dark night. So it was found here at Lowell Observatory by a 23-year-old intern, if you will, working very hard and uh, it's been a proud part of our history ever since. And of course, we can't ignore the Clark Refractor. It's one of the main prides of Lowell, because during its lifetime, it was a revolutionary tool for space exploration. I am most proud of really the people that work at Lowell Observatory. There is a huge passion amongst the entire staff about what we do here at Lowell, all the way from the astronomers, all the way down to the retail staff, and everywhere in between, it's, there's a lot of passion. People love what they do. We've experienced all of the possible kinds of heights in Arizona, from the deepest meteor crater to the vast emptiness of the universe. But who would have thought that the lowest point in Arizona actually came from the highest possible point? Space. Reaching new heights, I'm Tessa for the NH2V. Getting high on Arizona. And so you see, like everything in life, Every new beginning starts with an ending. It's the basic principle we all have to follow. The inevitable laws of the universe. And so of course, unfortunately, our show is coming to an end now as well. So for now, reaching new heights, my name is Vera Limburg. And I'm Victor Norbert. Thanks for watching and remember, always strive to reach higher. Goodbye.